For those of us who came of age in the early 1950s, Saturdays were special days during the long summers of our youth. Assuming chores were done and you stared up the price of admission, you could spend hours in your local movie palace watching an action-packed double feature, sometimes an exciting serial, or your favorite cartoon characters, previews, and even a newsreel. For my brother and me, our 25 cent allowances brought not only admission to the air-conditioned wonder of Kannapolis' gym theater, but popcorn, a soft drink, and a few pieces of penny candy. We were instantly transported far beyond the boundaries of our small world by the magic of those flickering images. Well, drink this hot brandy, it'll do you good. We learned early lessons of courage and proper conduct and avidly followed the exploits of our favorite movie stars. I'm Clarence Horton. On behalf of those persons and organizations that are dedicated to preserving the history of old Cabarrus County and her people, Welcome to another historical moment in her story. Join us as we look back at the history of many of those early movie theaters of Cabarrus County and mourn the passing of almost all of them. Although agriculture was still a vital part of our economy at the beginning of the 20th century, America claimed first place among industrialized nations. The majority of Americans still lived on farms or in small communities, however, and were hungry for new forms of entertainment. Almost every small town in the country boasted a performance hall that could be used for traveling vaudeville shows, as well as traveling companies of actors and opera singers. Those halls could easily be adapted to accommodate one of the marvels of the new century, projected flickering images of persons and objects in actual motion. Residents of Cabarrus County were among those who enthusiastically flocked to witness the latest advances by American filmmakers and who welcomed the motion picture industry with its dramatic stories of damsels in distress and western heroes who faithfully followed the cowboy code of conduct. The movie industry had humble beginnings, however. Early films were only a few minutes in length, had no story and no sound, but instead portrayed an object or a person in action. Viewers were fascinated and flocked to watch the exciting segments of film on the new kinetoscopes or vitoscopes. Edison and other inventors swiftly made progress on cameras that would follow the action and improve the quality of the captured image. In 1901, the nation lost its president, William McKinley, to an assassin's bullet. His massive funeral procession was documented using stationary cameras placed along the funeral route. The historical footage was soon being shown at locations all across the country, still grieving for his fallen president. The movies first came to Concord when the images of the McKinley funeral were shown in a carnival tent erected on Barbrick Street in Concord. In 1903, films first began to tell a story when the Edison companies released an eight-minute film called The Great Train Robbery. There was no sound, but in 1907, producers began to use subtitles to allow more subtle plots and emotions. In most localities, the halls in which those early movies were screened were also used for other entertainments, especially vaudeville shows. Same was true in Concord, where city directories confirmed that by 1908, the Theatorium was open and showing moving pictures at 20 South Union Street, the present location of Gianni's Italian Restaurant. 
By 1911, the Theatorium with Charles M. Eisenhower as proprietor was joined next door by the Pastime, a vaudeville theater, which was also under Mr. Eisenhower's ownership. By 1916, when the movies were becoming one of the nation's largest industries, Concord could boast of 11,000 persons in its population and three movie theaters. Early cliffhanger serials like The Perils of Pauline continued to pull in ever larger audiences. Construction on nearby Kannapolis began in 1906. Textile pioneer J.W. Cannon intended to build a model mill town on a little more than a thousand acres in northern Cabarrus County and southern Rowan County. Included in his plans was a full service YMCA to serve as the social center of this unique community. The original building was completed in 1908 and the first movies in Kannapolis were screened in its auditorium. The YMCA was so popular that the first building was twice enlarged. The resulting 1925 Moorish style building included a 1400 seat auditorium which housed the Y Theater. That theater screened wholesome family fare and was very popular with the mill workers who enjoyed watching the latest movies while waiting for their shifts to begin in the nearby plants. In Concord, these early theaters continued to be concentrated on Union Street. Closer to the square formed by the Depot Street crossing, Charles Eisenhower was proprietor of the new Piedmont Theater, also advertising top quality motion pictures. Although the new Piedmont Theater lasted less than a decade, the popular pastime moved a few doors down to 26 South Union Street, where it operated until 1957. Just north of the square, at 3 North Union and beside today's Bee Lady, Brandon Means and Lewis Wallace operated the Star Theater, which advertised itself as the headquarters for high-class motion pictures. Later, the Star became the State Theater and continued to operate at the same location until competition led to its closure in 1955. An imposing new theater opened just north of the state in about 1929 when the Concord Theater was built and decorated in the style of the great movie houses, opening its door to both motion pictures and live vaudeville acts. It became known as the Paramount in 1933, then the Center Theater, and finally the Cinema before its closure in 1978. Although the building has been renovated into restaurants and various stores and shops, vestiges of the grand style of the old Concord Theater may be found on the ceiling of the second floor of the renovation, which houses the Chez Francois Ballroom. In the late 1940s, the Roxy Theater opened on Lincoln Street in Concord to serve the city's African-American audience. The Roxy was listed in the 1949 Concord City Directory, but it closed its doors by 1956. During the heyday of the 1920s, according to the Sanford insurance map, a movie theater opened in Mount Pleasant on South Main Street. Although we have little information about its operations during the 1930s and 1940s, it reopened in the building located behind me, known as the Paula, and named after Paula Foyle, the daughter of Paul Foyle, member of a well-known Mount Pleasant family and local businessman. It provided local entertainment for the community through the late 1950s before its closure. Thereafter, it's been opened on occasion, according to local tradition, for special showings, such as the premiere of the Ten Commandments. Local historians also say that movies were sometimes shown on Franklin Street in a large tent located on the present location of Marvin's Farmhouse Restaurant. In the meantime, a number of developments forever changed the movie industry. By 1910, actors began to get credit for their roles, and the star system was born. 
In that same year, newsreels were created and became very popular with audiences who were hungry for actual images of world events. By far, however, the most significant advance was the improvement of technology that made it possible to have synchronized sound accompany the action on the screen. In 1927, the enormously popular Al Jolson starred as the jazz singer, a feature film which included the first synchronized dialogue and singing. The industry and its future were forever changed. The most spirited competition to the Paramount and other downtown Concord theaters came from the Cabarrus Theater, opened in June 1939 beside the Hotel Concord and across from its chief competitor. The Cabarrus Theater was the first air-conditioned theater in Concord, competed for the best first-run movies, and advertised them in eye-catching ways. Some theaters had special promotion and what were called dish nights, at which moviegoers received dishes or inexpensive glassware with their admissions. Meanwhile, in nearby Kannapolis, Charles Cannon decided to build the finest theater between Washington and Atlanta, a theater designed to not only screen feature films, but whose stage could also accommodate live acts, touring film stars, and even the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The new theater, appropriately named The Gym, was decorated in Art Deco style. Its terracotta exterior was covered with a wheat design, and mirrored walls were a highlight of the twin staircases that led upstairs to the balcony and the restroom facilities. The walls featured beautifully carved birds of paradise, and the ceiling molding was covered with gold leaf trim. When the showplace opened on December 31st, 1936, ushers and other employees were dressed formally, and refreshments were not sold and were not allowed in the theater. Eventually, a popcorn machine was installed and candy and soft drinks allowed. For about a year, the YMCA Theater and the gym were both operated by the officials of the Kannapolis YMCA until the Y tragically burned in December 1938. Although a magnificent YMCA structure was erected in Kannapolis in 1940, it didn't contain a formal theater. By that time, with the continuing success of motion pictures in those glory days, other theaters were springing up to serve the Kannapolis area. The Colonial Theater was opened in North Kannapolis along North Main Street near the site of what was later the Rowan County Sheriff's Department. The Colonial competed with the downtown theaters for first-run movies, proudly hosting the first showing in the area of the immensely popular Gone with the Wind. In eastern Kannapolis, a new multi-lane highway was built around town to relieve congestion and to serve the established Royal Oaks community and the new community of Jackson Park. The main theater was built there to serve the thriving new area and prosper during the heyday of the silver screen. Its building has since been the home of several well-known local businesses, including Malone's Outlet and Shoe Show. Movies continue to be big business in Kannapolis. In a traditional African-American section of Kannapolis, surrounding Carver High School, the Palace Theater, which seated 350 persons, had a grand opening on May 20th, 1938. At that time, admission was 10 cents for children, 20 cents for adults. Soon after, the Dixie Theater, with a seating capacity of more than 500, was built on South Main Street near the railroad underpass. Dixie opened on June 12, 1939, with H.R. Butler as manager, Admission to the new Dixie was 10 cents for children and 15 cents for adults. On New Year's Day in 1940, 
Tallow City Theaters Incorporated, a new corporation, took over operation of the Jim, Dixie, and Palace Theaters with Walter Powell as the first manager. Prior to that time, the three theaters had been managed by officials at the local YMCA. The three were soon joined by the Swanee Theater, which was constructed on West Avenue in Kannapolis, a short walk from the gym, and which opened on November 1, 1940, with a showing of Seven Sinners, starring Marlene Dietrich and John Wayne. Tragedy struck the queen of Tau City Theaters, however, when fire destroyed a portion of the gym theater in February 1942. With the war underway, there were no building materials available at that time to repair the gym, although the front portion of the theater was occasionally used for the distribution of ration coupons. Repairs on the main portion of the building were delayed for years. Then builders who worked from the original plans for the building painstakingly reproduced the gym in its original look and opened it to an eager public on March 15, 1948. Admission then was only 12 cents for children, 40 cents for adults. In addition to first-run movies, live shows were also frequently scheduled. They included stars like War Rogers and Trigger, Fred Kirby, Lash LaRue, and country music icons including Jimmy Dickens and his Grand Ole Opry, and Cannonball and his country cousins. The traditional single screen theaters were soon joined by a new phenomenon, the drive-in theater. By the outbreak of World War II, there were a few drive-in theaters scattered across the country. However, the war and the gas shortages hurt the growth of the industry. But during the economic boom, following the end of war, theaters spread quickly across the country. During the 1950s and 60s, some 4,000 drive-in theaters blanketed the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. In Concord, three popular drive-ins served a large area of the county. The Willis on Poplar Tent Road, the Concord Airport Drive-In, in the vicinity of Cold Springs Church Road, where we're filming today, and the Starlight on Highway 29 South, just past the present location of Lowe's. In the Kannapolis area, three drive-ins joined the six single-screen theaters, the Translux, the Plaza, and the Park Inn Theater. Translux was located along Highway 29 South near the Zaire Shopping Center, the Plaza along North Main Street near West 22nd Street and Plaza Drive, and the Park Inn Theater behind what became the Kannapolis Kmart and then the Cabarrus Human Services Center. Families enjoyed their nights out at the drive-in, watching a movie from the privacy of their own cars, sound provided by the familiar individual speakers hooked inside the car windows. Children enjoying the food they either brought with them or the thrill of visiting the concession stand for freshly cooked french fries and cold bottle drinks. Unfortunately, by war's end, the age of television began to erode the large audience for motion pictures. Between 1946 and 1953, more than one in four theaters closed, a victim not only of TV, but of increased expenses for renting first-run movies and the substantial 20% admissions tax. Movies fought back with innovations such as epic films in CinemaScope and widescreen. Audiences flocked to watch The Robe, The Ten Commandments, and Cleopatra. For a time, 3D films such as House of Wax and Preacher from the Black Lagoon attracted new audiences. To accommodate the changes, the Gym Theater in Kannapolis installed a widescreen in 1953 along with a stereo sound system. Ever-popular Disney animated films captivated 
a new generation and the Disney studio added literary classics such as Old Yeller and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea to its portfolio. For a time, the movies seemed to hold their own. The television technology continued to improve and VCRs made it possible to watch movies on demand in your own home. The economics of the industry finally began to doom the single screen theater. It was increasingly unprofitable to compete with the large multiplex movie theaters. The wide variety of movies available at one location drew patrons even with higher ticket prices and refreshment costs. In Kannapolis, the Dixie closed in 1957, the Palace in 1969, and the Swanee in 1971, joining the Colonial and the main theaters. The day of the drive-ins was also nearing an end, and few survived. The Dixie Theater on South Main Street was renovated by owner Cannon Mills Company and operated as Table Supply, a grocery store for years. The building that housed the Palace Theater is now home to a mortuary. The Swanee Theater was widely renovated after its closure and reopened in 1974 as the visitor center for Cannon Mills Company. The Colonial Theater on North Main was totally demolished and removed from the site, and the main theater has housed several businesses. In the 1990s, the management of the Gym Theater realized it couldn't survive just trying to compete for expensive, first-run films, even with its large auditorium. In an effort to keep admission prices near their attractive low levels, management decided to concentrate more on second-run films, particularly those suitable for family entertainment. Today, manager Steve Morris continues to keep admission and refreshment prices at or near traditional levels and also show first-run quality movies to his loyal clientele. Part of the attraction of the gym is made up of nostalgia and sentiment. As the only great single-screen movie palace of the Depression era surviving in the region, it allows another generation to take part in an experience that was treasured by their parents and their grandparents. The mirrored walls along the spiral staircases reflect a more elegant time, a time when the flickering images on the silver screen awakened a sense of wonder and captured our imaginations, opening our eyes to elegance and transporting us to the far corners of the world. We're glad you could join us as we added a few images to the history of this special place, this Cabarrus. We hope to see you again real soon.